Hello everyone, this is Jason from Primetime Aquatics and in this video we are continuing our series on breeding fish for profit. In today's video, I'm going to give you 10 options that will make you money in a 29 gallon aquarium. I hope you enjoy the video. Okay, so if this is the first time you are viewing these videos in this series, I highly recommend go back and watch the other three because we've done videos on what to think about before you begin the process of breeding fish for profit. In the previous two videos, we looked at options for both a 10 gallon and a 20 gallon. I will put those videos in the description below because anything you can breed in a 10 and a 20 can also be bred in a 29 and that will give you even more options for your 29 gallon aquarium. So what we're doing here is we're looking at fish that I think fit really well in a 29 gallon aquarium. Some fish that can breed and bring in a little bit of money to help support your hobby or accomplish whatever goals you want to accomplish. As we go through these fish, keep in mind for a lot of these fish, I have species profiles that will give you a lot more information on how to keep them and how to breed them successfully. I'll put those in the description below. Also, for some of these fish, we're gonna be able to keep plants with our fish. I have a beginner's guide to keeping aquatic plants in the description below if you want more information there as well. Okay, so the first one. I think a really good option for a 29 gallon are bristle nose plecos. Here we want to be a little bit careful as to the type of bristle nose pleco that we breed because the type is going to determine the amount of money you can bring in. So for instance, if you've got the standard brown bristle nose plecos, those can bring in a little bit of money, but out of all the potential options, they're going to bring in the least. The advantage to breeding these fish is they ship relatively easily and you can generally move them at just about any type of mechanism we talked about in the first video. The downside to breeding bristlenose plecos is once you have a group of them, of 20 or 30 of them, they can make a mess. They eat a lot, and so you're going to have to keep up with your tank maintenance to make sure all the waste is being removed as they eat. The other thing to consider is once they start to breed and they grow to what I call a critical mass in the tank, they may stop breeding altogether. In fact, that's what's happened in some of our bristlenose breeding tanks is once we get a generation or two in that tank, if we haven't moved them out yet, they don't really breed after that point, at least for our purposes. Uh, can you grow plants in the tanks? Yeah, we've had pretty decent luck with some of the more hardy plants like Anubias, Jungle Val, we can float that in our tanks, Hornwort, uh, we can grow Anubias in those tanks, so that's something to consider. And because they produce a decent amount of waste, those plants will help keep the nitrate levels down, give you a little bit more time in between water changes. My recommendation, if you're interested in breeding bristle nose plecos, Look for the long fin varieties and try to find varieties that have a little bit more color. The super reds are really nice. I've had some blue eyed long fin. They call them albino because their, their body is albino, but they have blue eyes, long fins, long fin green dragon plecos. I know for some of you, you might not like the long fins, but when it comes to selling the fish, it's, and please keep this in mind, it's not necessarily about what you like, it's about what's going to sell. And the long fin varieties, tend, at least in our area, tend to bring in a lot more money than the short fin, short fin varieties do. The next thing that you could consider in a 29 gallon, at least temporarily, are angelfish. In a 29 gallon, my recommendation is if you have a pair in there, that's the only thing you're gonna to wanna to keep in that tank. Give them a breeding cone. We've done a species profile on them. I'll put that in the description below. Like I said, we'll have a lot of species profiles in the description below. But if you just have a pair, let them grow up. Now there's a couple things to consider. One, angelfish, when they first begin to breed, they may not allow the fry to survive. And so sometimes they will eat the fry. Two, they're going to produce a lot of fry. So it's really important for you as a breeder to call some of the fry that are not meeting your standards. And so if you see bent fins or missing fins or misshapen bodies, don't allow those fish to grow to full size. Now, the other thing you have to consider is often angelfish will have a lot of fry. And so one of the things that you need to think about is again, the types of angelfish that you are breeding. If you're just breeding standard mixed angelfish or just the standard black angelfish, you're probably going to get less money than if you're breeding some of the, maybe the pearl scales or the blue metallics, some of these more exotic angelfish. If you can breed the Altum angel, that would be really something. Those will go for a lot of money. Now, when it comes to shipping angelfish, that might not be as easy to do as some other fish that we've talked about in the past, but they generally move okay. I wouldn't say that they are gonna bring in a lot of money, especially if they're the more common types, 
But if you happen to be in a market where not a lot of people are breeding angelfish, you can make a little bit more money. Something else to consider, another live bear, and we've talked about a couple in both 10s and 20 gallons, and that is the swordtail. Again, when it comes to swordtails, you're gonna to wanna to find varieties of swordtails that are more pleasing to the eye. And again, ideally you'd want something, maybe we've got a male and two or three or four females, let them be in the 29 on their own. The one thing that you will have to consider is a lot of cover for these fish, and you may want to consider moving the fry and, or the parents out of the tank once you start to see the fry growing in that, in that breeding tank. You could potentially start breeding the standard size mollies. I don't necessarily like breeding the sailfin mollies in a 29 because I think they get too big, but standard mollies, we've had some really good luck. In our 50 gallon low boy right behind us, we have black mollies that have been breeding in that tank relatively easily. We did a species profile on mollies because there's a lot of misconceptions about growing them and breeding them. That's a video, if you're interested in breeding mollies, I would definitely watch that video just to make sure that you are on the right track. But mollies can be great, again, if you've got some different types of colorations, like maybe the Dalmatian mollies, those can be really cool. I think the mollies and the swordtails are probably best when you're, you have a local fish store that will buy them, they ship okay. And so that can be an advantage over some of the other fish that we've talked about. And again, the nice thing is you can grow some plants both with your sword tails and your mollies and try to double up the income you've got coming from that tank. The other fish that I really like for a 29, and this is not as common, and that is a lot of the Lake Victorian cichlids. We were growing, we were breeding some species 35 tomato halves in our 29 gallon tanks. Uh, in a 37 as well, which has basically the same footprint. And these are really pretty fish. If there's one disadvantage to breeding some of the Lake Victorian cichlids, it's that it's gonna take a little bit of time for them to color up. And so you're gonna have to hang on to the fish a little bit longer and you're gonna also have to manage the aggression. Now, if you can find that balance of breeding the fish, getting them to a point where just about they're ready to color up and then get them out, you're gonna be in potentially good shape. It's something that once they do color up and you bring them to a pet store, people are really going to notice those fish. Also, if you've got some semi-adults that are colored up, they make for really good pictures. So when you're trying to sell them via classifieds or sell them online, they are really striking fish depending on the type of Lake Victorians that you pick. There are also some imbunas you could start to consider in a 29 gallon tank, although I don't recommend most imbuna cichlids for a 29. I think it's too small, but something like a rusty cichlid, this is something that we bred in a 33 long, but we had them in actually in a 20 gallon before we moved into the 33 long and they were breeding in our 20 gallon. So they are a little bit less aggressive and if you get them on a lighter substrate, they show a really nice purple color. They've got this kind of rusty brown and purple body. It's something that's pretty striking and at least in our area, in the Chicagoland area, they're not as common as some of the other fish and bunas that you might see. Something that's a little bit unusual and that is Cryptoheros nanoluteus. These are fantastic fish that we've had in a 29 for a while. The fish are amazing. They're a little bit unusual, but because of their coloration and their bright blue eyes, this is something that I think would be easily moved to a local fish store, or if you brought them to a swap or an auction, people are gonna really love them. Shipping them is not as hard as shipping some of the Lake Tanganyikan fish, which is good. The downside so far to not only the Ambuna, the Lake Victorians, and these Crypto Heroes is the plant situation. Uh, certainly with the African cichlids, it's not going to happen. With the Nanoluteus, it seems like they are eating some of our plants, so you might not want to mix those quite as much, at least in terms of making money. But if you're breeding those fish, that's a potential really nice looking fish that isn't as common in the hobby. Another fish that's a little bit uncommon is a Lake Tanganyikan fish, our Neolamprologus calvus. These are really cool. They come in different varieties. They are Lake Tanganyikan, so if you're going to try to ship them, that's not necessarily a good option, but they often do really well at swaps and auctions. They are fish that can generally be moved. The downside to these fish is if you buy them young, you're going to be waiting and waiting and waiting for these fish to get to a size where they are able to breed. They grow very, very slow. That's also a downside when selling them. And so a lot of times you'll see these calvas and they cost a lot of money at a local fish store because it takes so long to get them to the breeding size and it takes a while for them to actually grow up to they, so they can get to a size that's actually sellable. One of the other fish that you could consider for a 29 gallon aquarium is Neolamprologus lelupi. They come in two different varieties. One is an orange, one is a more yellow, but these are again, a great Lake Tanganyikan fish. 
that can do pretty well because they color up so early on that they can be you can move them a little bit sooner than a lot of other fish but again being lake tanganyika they're not as easy to ship but they generally do very well at swaps and auctions and places where you can do a drop off or a local fish store because of their great color another interesting fish that i like a lot is dichrosis these are great fish you have to have a little bit of experience with fish but this is something where if you've got water that's maybe neutral or slightly less and you've got softer water this can be a really pretty fish to try highly recommend it it's something because it's so pretty because it stays smaller it's a little bit easier to move all right everyone if you want more information on how to breed these fish check out these videos on the upper right hand and lower right hand corner i appreciate you being here we'll see you in the next one